Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual masterclass, where we'll be looking at priority pests and diseases um, across the Sydney Basin. So my name is Maddie Quirk from Ausveg, and I'll be facilitating today's session. But before we do get into the program, I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I'm here on Wurundjeri country today, but wherever you're joining us from, may we acknowledge country from which we produce our food and its people who have looked after and survived on this land for thousands of years. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So this masterclass is brought to you by the Ausveg Periurban Biosecurity Pilot Program in partnership with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and New South Wales Local Land Services. The program is funded through the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. So a bit of background to this program. In 2018-19, the gross value of agricultural production in the Greater Sydney region was $768 million, which was 7% of the total gross value of agricultural production in New South Wales of $11.7 billion. With the Greater Sydney growing region being in close proximity to Sydney and the ports and seaports, the need to uphold strong pest and disease management activities has never been so important. So today we're focusing our efforts um, to support your business through strengthening support on um, pest and disease management, as well as encouraging testing of pests and diseases of concern and providing support on how to do this. In particular, we'll be discussing TOSPA viruses, serpentine leaf miner, and cucurbit diseases. I'd like to introduce our speakers, Shannon Mulholland from New South Wales DPI, and Len Tessarero from CropDoc Consulting, who will be talking about the pests and diseases today, as well as our peri-urban program consultant, John Fletcher, who will be assisting with Q&As, and Sylvia Jelinek from New South Wales Local Land Services, who will be delivering some exciting news on the Vegetable Extension Network program. Okay, so the COSPO viruses, and you'd be aware that tomato spotted wolf virus is a common virus that has been around for over 100 years. In fact, it was first recorded in Australia um, before it was found anywhere else in the world, but it probably, well, it is, in fact, that virtually all around the world are known to be. And patient's necrotic spot virus was an, a similar virus to, to tomato spotted wilt, having a very wide host range and turned up in Australia um, about uh, a decade ago, a bit over a decade ago. But more recently, it's occurred in the Sydney Basin on lettuces. Um, in patients with necrotic spot generally, uh, and in fact, when we first found it, was in a nursery situation. So it seems right around the world to be an important disease on a lot of ornamental plants, uh, as well as vegetables. So they've got very wide host ranges. Um, and we found it in, a, in um, New South Wales affecting uh, hydroponic lettuces and some field lettuces um, but at both ends of the Sydney Basin, in fact. And to date, we haven't really found it anywhere else in uh, uh, New South Wales or Australia. Um, so it's pretty well restricted uh, in where it occurs. Now, these viruses, uh, interestingly, uh, probably evolved in thrips, the, this group of viruses and uh, thrips are the key vectors. And uh, of probably something, um, hundreds of different thrip species, only a bit over a dozen of them are able to uh, transmit this virus. And it turns out that we've got uh, a few of those viruses, a, a few of those thrips in Australia. So the Western fowl thrips you might uh, uh, know about, um, it turned up in Australia in the late, late 80s. And uh, it's a very efficient vector. Before that, we always had onion thrips, uh, which are very common. And onion thrips can transmit both tomato spotted wilt and in patients necrotic spot. Interestingly, there's another TOSPO virus called onion yellow spot virus, which we have found in New South Wales, affecting onions and related plants. But it's not really significant in terms of yield losses for things like spring onions and, and, the, and the like. Uh, it seems to be more important in seed crops. Uh, tomato thrips, um, we find them more inland, but they are present in the Sydney Basin. It can transmit tomato spotted wilt virus, 
I haven't found any real references to whether it can transmit in patients necrotic spot virus. Uh, this third column is a virus, another TOSPO virus called capsicum chlorosis virus, which is found in Queensland. We haven't found it in New South Wales to any great extent at this stage. Uh, there's another TRIPS, which I only recently found out about, which is present in New South Wales called the Oriental Tomato TRIPS. And it can also spread this capsicum chlorosis virus. So it's probably something um, that we need to keep an eye out for, uh, particularly as the capsicum chlorosis virus can have some similar symptoms to the tomato spotted wolf virus and in patients necrotic spot virus, particularly on things like capsicums and, and chilies. And then there's the melon thrips. And again, that's been found in Northern Australia, but I don't think there are any records at this stage in New South Wales, and it too can spread this capsicum chlorosis virus. So it's a much warmer temperature uh, thrip species and uh, occurs in more tropical areas. But it's something that we need to watch out for, uh, particularly if uh, we're growing, uh, say, capsicums in greenhouses and the like. So here's some symptoms, typical symptoms of tomato spotted wilt. As the name suggests, it affects tomatoes. Uh, it can be really devastating inland on processing tomatoes. Um, and uh, in the Sydney basin, we'll see it on things like uh, capsicum grow growing in the summertime. Um, interestingly, we, we haven't really seen symptoms on eggplants. So even though it affects a lot of the solanaceous vegetables, um, it may well infect eggplants, but we don't really see it. And there are some reports overseas that it affects brassicas, um, whereas we don't see any symptoms on brassicas uh, in New South Wales. Uh, but my understanding from John is that there have been some records on some brassicas like broccoli and cabbages in Victoria, but it's symptomless. But it does mean that it could uh, allow the thrips to spread it from those into uh, other crops such as lettuce. And in fact, uh, several years ago now, when I was looking at some lettuce crops that I think something like about one in eight plants was infected with tomato spotted wolf virus, um, there were brassicas right next to it. And uh, they were full of thrips, but there were no symptoms on them. But as I said, they could be a, a, a good source of the virus. Um, other crops that we've seen it in um, are things like snow peas and snake beans, so the legume family. So as I said, these viruses have a very wide host range. Here's some images of the typical symptoms on lettuces, uh, field lettuces, uh, both uh, crisp head lettuces and fancy lettuce. Uh, one of the major weed hosts that we've found some of these viruses on is cape weed in the springtime. So a, a really important issue in terms of allowing the virus to move into crops is to allow the flowering of cape weed in the vicinity. And you can just see the little bit of, the, of those um, ring symptoms on the leaf of the cape weed there. And that image above is, is that um, from a begonia plant in an ornamental nursery from 10 years ago. And curiously, before we actually diagnosed in patients necrotic spot virus, they thought that might be a new kind of interesting character for a, um, for a, uh, a, a begonia line that they were growing. Uh, little did they know that uh, it was actually a virus infection and in fact, uh, in the end caused um, some significant losses to them. Here's some of the more recent images from uh, hydroponic lettuce. And one of the curious things we've noticed with impatience necrotic spot virus is that it quite often seems to be affecting the older leaves as, and not the young growth as we saw with the tomato spot and wolf virus. Uh, it's interesting as to why that might be, whether the virus just can't move from the old leaves back into the new leaves. Um, as we probably look out and survey more for this virus, we'll probably get more information about whether those symptoms are typical for inpatients necrotic spot, or they were just a, a bit of an incidental thing that we saw at the time. Another thing that, and this is something that's going to be important as we come into the warmer weather, was that we noticed that plants infected with virus, these TOSPO viruses, 
also become more susceptible to Pythium and Phytophthora root rots. And so not only do you get the problem that the virus is infecting and affecting the foliage, but then the plants start to uh, wilt and die as well. So it's, uh, again, demonstrating that you can have more than one disease. In terms of management, um, obviously crop and, and farm hygiene are really important. We have to remember that those thrips have a life cycle where they acquire the virus, they pick up the virus from an infected plant. So it might be something like a weed or whatever that they pick it up from. And there are probably some 1000 or so hosts, uh, plants that can be infected with the, uh, these viruses. Uh, and then they molt and, and eventually drop down in the ground and pupate. So it's in this period when they're in the ground, uh, they keep the virus and then they emerge as adults and then they can spread the virus as adults. So again, it's that life cycle. So if you've got um, uh, poor hygiene in and around your farm, you're going to allow these strips to um, complete their life cycle or to fly in from the edges. So monitoring is very important. Um, and also there is potential for uh, various controls, including biological control. So that pupation period in the soil, there are predatory mites available. So the hypoaspis mites, for example, and there are some uh, fungal parasites that are now being commercially formulated. Um, we haven't done any real research work on this as yet, but it would be an interesting study to see whether um, they can also be useful in breaking that life cycle. So stopping the pupae from, uh, I guess, maturing and then um, having those adults emerge. So they're the key things. There aren't any um, ways you can uh, cure an infected plant. Once they're infected, they're infected. Uh, it's all about uh, minimizing that risk through weed management, taking, I guess, that local um, or area-wide uh, management approach, looking around your crop, what whether there might be a field nearby with a lot of cape weed, uh, and and making sure that uh, those weeds are controlled before the virus builds up in them and the thrips build up as well. So that concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Len. We've had a question come through um, from Baram. Um, hi, Len. Is there any resistant varieties to INSV in lettuce? Some specific varieties are showing good tolerance to this virus. I think um, tolerance might be the key word that there's um, more likely to be um, varieties that uh, are less susceptible. It's hard to know whether it's that they're less palatable to thrips uh, or whether there's some inherent quality that they have. Certainly we know some varieties seem to be more susceptible. Um, so particularly the COS varieties seem to come down with the virus a lot worse. Um, but as I said, there's, um, it seems that a lot of varieties, including the crisp head lines, uh, seem to have susceptibility. So I'm not aware of any specific resistance genes at this stage. Um, so now we'll move on to Shannon Mulholland, who will be speaking on serpentine leaf miner. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks everyone for joining us online today too. We were really hoping to do this masterclass in person, but we've had to be a little bit flexible with COVID, but I'm really encouraged to see how many people have been able to join us today. It's great. All right, today I just wanted to give a very quick overview of where we're up to with Serpentine Leaf Miner. Um, there's quite a bit of information about this particular pest on our DPO webpage at the moment if anyone's after additional information. And there was certainly a more in-depth webinar that we presented at the end of last year if people are searching for more information. Today was just a quick update on where things are up to. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been a part of this situation over the last few months, uh, just a quick recap that we did find a serpentine leaf miner um, in the Sydney Basin around about this time last year. 
Uh, it was reported on a vegetable farm and causing quite significant damage to uh, the crops on that property. And we launched a biosecurity response to understand how widespread the infestation was, what crops were being affected, and see if there were measures that we could take to eradicate or contain the infestation. Uh, we saw infestations across many vegetable crops, uh, but ornamental crops were also um, impacted to a much smaller degree. And we were surveying as many host crops and vegetating areas as we could find because this particular pest species has a very broad host range of a couple of hundred different species. We have since detected serpentine leaf miner right across the Sydney basin and in a couple of regional areas of New South Wales, and it's also been detected in southeast Queensland as well. Because it was so widespread, uh, it was deemed not technically feasible to eradicate, and the response transitioned to a management phase at the end of last year where we changed gears from an eradication perspective to how do we provide enough support for industry to manage this pest ongoing. Just to give a bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar with it, serpentine leaf miner is a small leaf mining fly that inflicts some pretty serious damage on a range of vegetable and uh, ornamental crop species. The main damage it causes, uh, you can see in these two images quite clearly, uh, the speckled dots are from feeding and overpositing damage into the leaves. And then when it actually lays eggs in the leaves, the larvae hatch out and they will tunnel through the leaf surface, which leaves the little spirally tracks across the leaves. And that's what really causes some pretty significant injuries to the plant, it impacts its photosynthetic ability, and particularly for leafy vegetables, uh, really reduces the markability of that produce. We saw lettuce, beans, um, spinach and Asian veg particularly hard hit by this particular pest last year. Uh, part of that was the severity infestation on those properties and not potentially applying the best management approaches because at that point growers were still learning about what this thing actually was. Uh, but the infestations were popping up quite quickly on farms and then causing some fairly significant damage in the crops. We have also found it in a few weed species and we found it in a couple of the ornamental species as well. The key for this particular pest is it is a very tiny fly. It's only about Oh, it's less than two millimetres long. So it, the, the adult is very easily overlooked in the field. You tend to see the damage once the larvae start moving around and doing their thing. There are also several native species of leaf miner fly in Australia. They typically don't inflict the same level of damage on commercial crop varieties, although I am actually seeing them in the hunter at the moment uh, quite heavily infesting weeds, but they tend not to have the same commercial impact as what serpentine leaf miner does. So if you're seeing a leaf miner in the field, you really do have to get it checked to see what species it is because it is very difficult to diagnose in the field. There's a few different management options uh, for this particular pest, but really the best strategy is a, a sound IPM approach to encourage the beneficial insects. We know that there are a number of parasitic wasp species in Australia that already target leaf miners. And we certainly found quite a few different species when we were doing our surveillance in the Sydney Basin. So the beneficial insects are already there. They are already working for you. What we need to do is try and encourage that process as much as possible because they are a good control strategy. They're able to reach the larvae inside the leaf in a way that most other management strategies cannot. So it's something that we do want to encourage on farm. The thing to be reminded of though is these wasps are quite sensitive to many of the insecticides. So if you're using a fairly rigorous spray regime, uh, you can potentially be knocking out these beneficials and then you'll also see a surge in the pest population as well because the beneficials aren't there to try and manage that population size. There are a number of registered chemicals and off-label permits available. If you wanted to go down this path, we have a current list of products listed on the DPI website. All you have to do is Google New South Wales DPI leaf miner. There's a whole list of fact sheets there and there's the link to the chemical registrations. We're keeping an eye on those registrations at the moment. And so as registrations change, that's where the live update will be. Uh, I don't anticipate there will be too many changes in the near future, uh, but if you're looking for the, the most up-to-date list, that's where it's being kept. 
The other thing you want to try and avoid is if you have produce leaving your property uh, to make sure that we don't have leaf miner actually within that vegetative produce. That is uh, then preventing the risk of transmitting this particular pest to other properties and potentially to other regions. At the moment, most of the regional infestations have been connected in some way to plant produce movement between the Sydney Basin and the regional areas. So if we can be very mindful of what we're doing in that space, we can try and manage the risk of spread further into uh, the regional areas. And it just minimises the impact on other growers as well. A couple of points to remember for selecting the insecticides for this particular pest is, first of all, SLM is very difficult to control with pesticides. The most vulnerable life stage to the chemical are the larvae, but they are safely tucked up inside the leaf. So it's very difficult to get the chemical to where the larvae actually are. You need a translaminar insecticide and there are different efficacies of the products that are actually registered for use within Australia. So if you can incorporate the chemical approach as part of a broader management strategy, you're likely to have more success. We're seeing growers that are going down the purely insecticide control option having less success with controlling this pest on farm because they're also um, unfortunately taking out the beneficial insects as part of that process. It's really important to check that what you're using on your crop is actually registered for that crop and for serpentine leaf miner. Uh, if we have a registration, we know that there's technical data and evidence to support that that particular product is safe on that crop for this pest. If it's not registered for use, there could be safety issues attached to that. There could be uh, use issues associated with that as well. And there are sometimes phytotoxicity risks with some insecticides on some plants. So it's really important to make sure if you are selecting a chemical for application that it is registered for serpentine leaf miner in that particular crop. If you are going to apply chemicals, there are what we call in inverted commas a soft and a harsher chemical. The softer ones are gentler on the beneficial wasps. So we want to try and opt for those ones where you can so that we maintain that beneficial population within the crops. And it's important to rotate your mode of action groups for this particular pest as well. We know that serpentine leaf miner has developed resistance to certain chemical products overseas. Uh, and there's a little bit more detail about this on the website at the moment. So if you keep using the same thing in Australia, we will possibly see resistance developing as well. Most of the resistance that has developed overseas has been from very heavy use of chemicals that haven't been properly rotated, that haven't really been fit for purpose. So if we can be careful about what we're doing in Australia, we can try and preserve the efficacy of those chemicals for as long as possible. The other important thing to remember is if you are using a registered chemical for the right purpose for serpentine leaf miner and it's not working, we need to understand why that's happening. I'd highly recommend that if you are having this problem at the moment, get in touch uh, with Sylvia or Jonathan within LLS or myself or Maddie with Ausveg and communicate that information back because that's really important to know if there are registered chemicals that just don't seem to be working, that gives us the opportunity to investigate further. It's possible that there may be resistance there and that's a really important thing that we need to learn. Just to wrap up, uh, a quick update on what we're actually doing about the pest in order to support industry in managing another pest species. We've got quite a few projects happening at the moment just from New South Wales DPI and there are other projects happening around the country on leaf miner species in general. Uh, one of the things I'm working on at the moment is a climate modelling project where I'm actually working with our climate management team to develop a series of maps for New South Wales which can show us where we have a more suitable or less suitable climate area for this particular species, which will help give us some preemptive information about where to target surveillance operations, particularly beyond that Sydney Basin area and into the regional zones. Uh, we're hoping to have that data finished very shortly so that we can actually publish that and start sharing those images with the industry. We have an insecticide resistance team based on our EMAI site in Sydney that looks for resistance genes in pest insects. It's really important to understand if this particular population has brought any of these resistance genes with them. And because we don't know exactly where in the world this population originated from, we don't know 
what resistance it may have brought with it, if any at all. So they're currently working through that at the moment to start hunting for these resistance genes in case they are already in our population in Australia. And then we can provide more tailored information to industry about what chemicals to use or to avoid. There is uh, another research project that has uh, started this year that will be looking at surveillance operations right across New South Wales. We've been a little bit hampered of late uh, getting out and about because of all the lockdowns and the COVID situation at the moment, but we're hoping to get into the field for that very, very shortly. And that's going to be looking at mapping where this uh, pest is moving to and, and also to gather a little bit more data on the beneficial wasps and what we're actually finding out and about. Uh, we're also looking at working up new diagnostic tests so that we have uh, rapid sensitive tests that are really suitable for Australian conditions. And uh, just because biosecurity is the gift that keeps on giving, we've just had a report that another leaf miner species has been detected in northern, uh, northern Australia uh, within the last couple of months. So there are currently five leaf miner species recognised as serious pest species around the world. Uh, we had vegetable leaf miner detected in far north Queensland a few years ago, and it doesn't seem to have moved from that location at all, which is good. We have serpentine leaf miner that we found in the Sydney Basin last year, and we now have American serpentine leaf miner, which is a different species found around the top of Northern Territory and Western Australia uh, in recent months. So we're keeping an eye on that situation. Uh, I know that there are teams up in those northern districts that are conducting surveillance and we'll be monitoring that to see if it maintains its location in the tropics or if it starts to spread south. If that happens, then we start working on how do we prepare for that. Um, and I'm just having a look at the Q&A chat. Um, the question that's come through is, it looks like there are a, a current registered chemicals by themselves are not very effective on serpentine leaf miner. Are there any guidelines for IPM, such as using cards, traps, combined with chemicals to control the pressure? Uh, growers in the Sydney Basin are starting to use sticky traps and it showed to be effective to bring down the population. Um, I'm not aware of specific IPM guidelines that have been developed just yet, uh, but that is currently being worked through in conjunction with some of the other research projects that are in progress right now. This is a new pest, so it does take a little bit of time to generate some of that evidence and provide the right advice. Uh, stick, sticky traps are a really good way of trapping adult flying insects for a whole range of different pest species. So it's certainly not going to be a bad thing to be doing that. Uh, but I, I'd say stay tuned at the moment and see if we can get some more uh, guidance on those IPM strategies at the moment. Uh, there has been a recent project looking at leaf miner pest species in Australia where they were looking at the beneficial parasitic wasps and there is more work being done on that at the moment. So hopefully that can provide some more detailed answers about what to do. All right, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and we'll just see if there were any other questions. Um, there was one more question that's just come through. Are we working with CESAR Australia on your climate modelling? Um, yes. CESAR has been involved in climate modelling for leaf miner species as part of their research project. The DPI one that we're working on at the moment is actually part of a much broader vulnerability assessment project, which is looking at how climate change impacts on agriculture in general. So we have animal projects, we have agricultural production projects, and we have biosecurity projects as well. We've managed to fit serpentine leaf miner in as one of those uh, categories. So we are liaising with CESAR as part of our technical expert panel for that particular pest species. Uh, but we're not directly part of their research project, if that makes sense. Uh, and there's another question just on what species of ornamental plants were affected. I knew I was going to be asked this, so I've just got the list up on the screen next to me. Uh, let's see. Snapdragon was one of the species and Petunia. Uh, they were the two ornamentals that we detected uh, serpentine leaf miner on in the Sydney Basin. It is well known to be affecting chrysanthemums uh, around the world, and they suspect that um, the flower trade internationally has contributed from movement between some of the American countries and European countries. Uh, so it's definitely a threat to the ornamental industry, not just vegetables, uh, but that's where we need a consolidated approach for management and surveillance as well. Um, I don't believe we had gerberas detected during the Sydney outbreak, but it's not to say that it's not found in gerberas. 
it just wasn't detected during the response program. And that's the only data I have at the moment about what species were impacted last year. So um, this afternoon, I'll just be briefly talking on a couple of R&D &D &E projects that have been um, occurring for serpentine leaf miner. So um, between 2017 and 2020, there was a Hort innova innovation funded project in place to prepare industry for exotic Luria Miser leaf miners, including serpentine leaf miner, American serpentine leaf miner and vegetable leaf miner. And this was recognising the impact that they could have on Australian horticulture, given that they weren't present in production regions at, the, at that time. And this project was led by Caesar Australia in partnership with the University of Melbourne, Plant Health Australia, the Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy and AusVeg. So as the MT16004 project concluded in 2020, and as Shannon has mentioned, this was at the same time as when serpentine leaf miner was first detected in Greater Sydney. Um, a substantial amount of critical work undertaken within the preparedness project was then used during the incursion response phase for serpentine leaf miner. Um, and as a result of the work that had been done in that project, a new, a new project, MT2005, was able to be quickly established in order to support growers in the management of serpentine leaf miner. So this project is a current port innovation funded project led by QDAF in partnership with Ausveg, CESA Australia, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and the University of Melbourne. So with that project up and running very quickly, we were immediately able to get onto the activities that I guess otherwise um, may have taken a, quite a bit longer to, to be achieved. So in regards to Serpentine Leaf Miner itself, the project is working towards developing in-field diagnostic testing for Serpentine Leaf Miner, as well as um, a surveillance protocol for Serpentine Leaf Miner, and developing a spread model for Serpentine Leaf Miner through CESA Australia. Um, and then there's also a crop protection gap analysis that's being undertaken. So this is in order to determine how controlling serpentine leaf miner will fit into the current management strategies and the resistance as well, which of course is critical for the management on ground of serpentine leaf miner. So in addition to that, through some on-ground um, survey work, the project partners are gaining a better understanding of the parasitoids that attack serpentine leaf miner in the affected regions. And um, while this has been quite difficult so far due to COVID, these um, plans are up and running and have been able to occur, particularly in Queensland. Um, and they're de determining how beneficial an insect might be um, incorporated into a pest management plan for serpentine leaf fire. And then the final task of the project is bringing all of the information together and com communicating that out to industry. So, Shannon also touched on American serpentine leaf miner being detected across the northern part of Australia. Um, but for this project, I guess the where to from here questions are um, answered by a project variation that has been approved by Hort Innovation. Um, and through that variation, project partners will be including American serpentine leaf miner into their current work program. And doing this makes a lot of sense because of all of the similarities between the um, pests, so between serpentine leaf miner and American serpentine leaf miner, and also the fact that the team and their work plans were already in place for serpentine leaf miner, so we were ready to add this to the program. And there'll be much more information to come on this in the coming months, so you can stay up to date on that by visiting the Ausveg website or contacting science at ausveg.com.au. All right. Cucumber green model mosaic virus. It's the virus we don't want to see in our vegetable crops. Um, I'm just going to refer to it as CGMMV because at this time of the afternoon, my tongue's tripping over a four or five letter word. Um, so CGMMV is a plant virus. It is a particularly nasty problem for the cucurbit crops. So we're talking cucumber, watermelon, zucchini, squash, pumpkin, that family of vegetables. Um, it is commonly uh, a serious problem in cucumbers and watermelons, although it has been detected in other species, that's generally the types of crops that we find it in in Australia. Uh, it can cause a whole range of symptoms on the leaves uh, from mottling to wilting, 
we can see early fruit abortion and it uh, has some fairly significant damage to the fruit as well. Because of the early fruit abortion, it reduces yield and it can be a little bit cryptic depending on the environment and the age of the plants. You sometimes see the symptoms develop um, in a younger age and then they start to disappear as the plant gets older, but the virus is still there. Uh, it's particularly damaging if you get infection prior to flowering, as with the case with many plant viruses. That's when you tend to see very severe impacts on the fruit. And it can be transmitted in a number of different ways, which is what makes this particular virus so challenging. It is seed borne. So although we test for CGMMV seed in Australia, um, it can be transmitted in seed. It can be soil borne as well. So if you have infection within a soil crop, you can find a viable virus up to a year or two after the initial infection is introduced. It's very mechanically transmissible uh, and it's transmitted in the sap of the plant. So if you damage uh, a stem or a leaf or a fruit in any way and that sap then makes contact with another surface, that can then transmit the infection to another plant. So if you're using cutting tools, if you've walked over leaves, driven over leaves, rubbed fruit up against a packing bin, if you then touch those contaminated surfaces with a clean plant, it can then contract the infection that way. Uh, and it can also be waterborne. So whilst it doesn't tend to be so much of an issue for field crops, if you're in a hydro situation, or in a protected cropping situation where you're recirculating water, it can become quite an issue. We only discovered this virus in Australia in 2014 up in the Northern Territory in Watermelon. And I've just put together a very quick timeline of some of the different detections around the country as we're starting to see this virus slowly shift southwards uh, and into New South Wales. The first detection in New South Wales wasn't until 2019. And I've been doing some fairly broad scale surveys of vegetable crops right across the state for the last couple of years with Len. And there's only been uh, a handful of detections uh, in New South Wales so far, which is a good sign. That means that it's not a widespread infection, but we're very keen that if we do find it, we want to contain it to those properties as much as we possibly can so that we don't have widespread impact across key production areas. And again, we're particularly finding the infection uh, pop up in watermelon and, and cucumber crops in the different states. As Len touched on earlier, once a plant has a virus, there isn't a product you can apply to the plant to cure the virus. So we shift from treating the virus to two different options. One of them is trying to prevent the virus making it to your property in the first place. And the other option is trying to make uh, as many changes on farm as you can to reduce the suitable environment for the virus. You want to reduce your disease opportunity across your property. So there's two different ways that we can have a look at that. The first is within the crop itself. Uh, it makes sense to use clean inputs and whether this be seed or seedlings, you want to be using seed that's been tested for CGMMV. You want to be using seedlings uh, and seed that are coming from reputable companies because uh, their level of hygiene should be uh, very good. If you have crops in the ground, you want to remove those crops quickly. As soon as they are finished their production cycle, you want to take them out of action. And that really applies to a whole heap of different cucurbit crops when you're managing viruses. The longer the crop is in the ground, the more opportunity you have for infection to establish. And then that can cause problems for the successive crops that you have growing around them. If you have something like CGMMV that is introduced to your cropping situation, crop rotation is a useful tool. As we touched on before, it can be a soil borne disease. So if we need to spell those paddocks for a couple of years to reduce the viral inoculum in the soil, uh, you can plant a range of other crops that are not susceptible to this virus uh, and to try and keep reducing the uh, virus particles until it gets to a point where it can't establish infection within a cucurbit crop. Bearing in mind with this particular disease, you could be looking at two years for that to happen. Another thing, that is important in terms of your crop management is to clean and sanitize your tools. Now this is anything from knives to packing bins uh, to even boots that you're wearing in the paddock. If you know that there is an infection in the field with this particular virus, sanitization is your new best friend. And if you have crops that are uninfected, then try and separate the workload between those crops so that you're moving from the clean, healthy crops into the dirty, infected crops uh, rather than the other way around. Otherwise, you're going to keep circulating the infection across the farm. 
If you want to take a step back and look at overall site management uh, from a more strategic perspective, something that you can look at right across the property are uh, removing uh, the host for CGMMV. So there are a number of weed species that can host this virus. If you're taking those hosts away, and most of these cucurbit crops are summertime crops, you're reducing your chance for the virus to overwinter when you don't have the host crops in the ground. And so the next summer when you go to put the crops back in, there's less of an opportunity for that virus to still be on the farm. You also want to look at really solid farm biosecurity. So that's monitoring, um, you know, who's coming and going on the farm, having a dedicated quarantine zone for new material or new equipment, uh, instill a farm biosecurity plan and make sure your staff are actually following your biosecurity plan. And if you don't have one or you need help establishing it, reach out. DPI and LLS, Ausveg, and Melon Australia, there's a whole raft of different agencies that can help you to put these systems in place. And a good farm biosecurity plan works across many different pests and diseases, not just CGMMV. But because this is a very difficult disease to manage, a solid farm biosecurity plan will really help in that effort. One thing I just wanted to mention too, if you are looking at sanitising equipment, not all disinfectants are equal. Many disinfectants highlight their antibacterial properties, which is great if you're treating a bacterial infection, but we're not, we're treating a virus. And an antibacterial product doesn't necessarily mean it's an antiviral product. So that's just something to be aware of. You also wanna make sure that the surface you're trying to disinfect is clean before you go down that path. If you are trying to disinfect a very dirty uh, piece of equipment, <clears throat> and whether that's actual physical dirt or it's grime or it's built up sap, you want to wash that uh, dirt and grime off the, off the implement first. If you think about viruses, we're talking on a very, very, very tiny scale. So within just a small particle of dirt, to us, it doesn't seem like a very solid place for a pathogen to hide, but on a virus, um, you, we're looking at the sub-microscopic level, there's a whole raft of places that that virus can then hide under that small particle of dirt. So we want the material as clean as we can, then apply the disinfectant, and then the disinfectant can actually make contact with the surface of the tool and actually work with the disinfectant properties. Um, excuse the rumbling in the background, it seems that the thunderstorms they predicted this afternoon are starting to turn up. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't knock out our internet before we finish. Um, and contact time is the other important thing. So if you're dunking a set of uh, cutting tools in and out of disinfectant in a few seconds, that may not be enough time for the disinfectant to actually penetrate and work. A couple of disinfectants that are very good for CGMMV management uh, include Vercon, bleach and non-fat milk powder. <clears throat> you want to make these up as fresh batches and replace them when they get dirty. Uh, particularly uh, bleach and Vercon their active ingredient does break down over time. So if you want to use uh, a disinfectant at its highest possible efficacy, you want to keep using fresh material. So it's sometimes better to just make up small fresh batches rather than having it sitting there for a month and you're using it at quarter strength of what you think you're actually using it at. <clears throat> there are a few different resources available for the management of this particular disease. Uh, we certainly have information on our website there is a national CGMMV management plan, which is helping to provide guidance to industry on how to manage this disease. Having a good farm biosecurity plan is also highly recommended. <clears throat> and there's a raft of different agencies that can help you with this. If you have uh, a suspect virus within your plants, um, then I would highly recommend sending samples into the plant health diagnostic service that we have at EMAI, which is just down in Menangle in Sydney. And then they can provide some clarity over exactly what disease you're looking at and then the technical advice uh, to, to deal with that infection. If you were to find CGMV on your property, <clears throat> because it is now established in Australia, it doesn't trigger a biosecurity response like it did when we first found it, but it does require some careful management and that's to try and minimize the spread of this infection to other properties. So if you have this disease or you suspect you have this disease, just get in touch with us and we can give you the technical advice to help you manage it. <clears throat> I have seen farmers try and do it on their own with varying levels of success and I have seen farmers work with DPI 
and they have had better success in managing this pathogen and been able to reduce the disease to a level where it's not having a severe economic impact. Um, so if you are at all concerned, reach out to us and we can be there to help support you and provide the technical advice that you need to try and manage this <clears throat> into the future. Uh, does it survive in the soil or in the plant material? Uh, and the technical answer is both. Uh, but if you have contaminated plant material in the soil, it will survive better and for longer. So if you have, um, you know, solid roots and stems incorporated into the soil, it can survive longer in that material. So just something to be aware of. Um, and I suppose if you are looking at it from a protected cropping perspective, you've also got um, media bags, uh, if replacing those media bags with the subsequent crop would be highly recommended so that you're actually trying to remove as much inoculum off the side as you can. I'll try and be brief. Uh, I'm going to talk about three diseases that probably most cucumber growers would have seen. They're um, things that uh, have been around for a number of years, so therefore very different from the cucumber green model mosaic virus issue. So I'll talk about the two mildews uh, and fusarium wilt. Uh, with downy mildew, uh, it's an interesting one in that it's uh, one that we don't see all that often, mostly because most growers have got it under control in greenhouse cucumbers. I'm gonna try and uh, restrict this to cucumber production at, um, in greenhouses. Um, it's a, a pathogen that's very similar to a fungus. It's an oomycete. And uh, it's uh, something that requires free moisture for infection to occur. So weather like we've had over the last few days in the Sydney Basin are highly conducive for, to this uh, type of disease and the development. Uh, and so management uh, from a cultural point of view comes down to trying to keep the leaves dry. So uh, when the humidity is high and the temperature goes down in the evening, uh, venting the greenhouse, uh, getting that uh, air out, that moist air out is one of the key ways of controlling the disease to prevent that wetness from occurring. There are a number of chemical controls uh, and uh, preventative strategies are important. Uh, what I should say is there's a, a range of new chemistry that's come in uh, being registered for downy mildew over the last five years. So it's important that uh, growers who haven't uh, I guess gone back and looked at uh, some of the lists of chemicals that are available, have a look at those. And I've just updated some for the local land services. So hopefully um, that's something Sylvia and Jonathan can uh, uh, get out to growers uh, with some of the newer products that are available, but um, probably weren't around when we last spoke about a disease like this. Um, and removing the older crops and avoiding working in a in an old crop and then going to a younger crop to reduce that um, uh, um, the spores moving from the uh, older crops and then physically taking them over and working in younger crops is pretty important. Uh, I'll talk about powdery mildew. Oh, I should say with downy mildew, I wanted you to notice the angular spots of those um, lesions, those yellow lesions. Um, there's two similar diseases that you could confuse with downy mildew. One of them is a disease, a bacterial disease called angular leaf spot. And the other is uh, a fungal disease called alternaria leaf spot. Now with alternaria, the, the spots generally are bigger and rounder and they don't get restricted by the veins as you can see in this image. Uh, so they're much bigger and you can see the dark or black uh, spores that form under the leaf surface. With the downy mildew as the fungal spores or the fungal-like spores appear, they tend to be a bit of a purplish colour. And with the bacterial uh, leaf, angular leaf spot, you don't see any um, fungal or similar types of mycelial growth on the uh, undersurface. So it's pretty important that you make sure that you're not misdiagnosing because some of those chemicals that are registered for downy mildew will not be effective against uh, uh, diseases, uh, bacterial diseases, or the true fungal diseases like alternaria. Uh, powdery mildew, again, there's a lot of uh, inbuilt 
resistance in varieties, but again, many, many of the varieties tend to have some inbuilt resistance in them. And the disease itself is favoured by um, low light intensity, and in particular where you've possibly used a bit too much fertiliser, you've got very soft leafy growth that enables the uh, uh, fungal spores to uh, infect more easily. Uh, one big difference between powdery mildew and downy mildew is you don't need free moisture for the powdery mildew to cause infection, uh, but it does also, um, it is favoured by high humidities inside the greenhouse. So again, trying to make sure uh, you don't have uh, long periods of time with, with very high humidity is one way of managing it. So venting again is important. Um, there's again several chemicals registered for the control of powdery mildews and again uh, there's a fair suite of new products that are available so uh, again it's something uh, to, to try and update yourselves with some of the uh, newer products and rotate between the different chemical activity groups so again uh, try and get hold of uh, the latest editions of those chemical tables so that you can uh, make yourself acquainted with uh, some of the new products. Uh, crop and farm hygiene, and it's very similar to what uh, was mentioned already by Shannon and myself. So fusarium wilt, just to finish off, uh, probably the most significant disease affecting cucumbers. I've seen some crops that are completely wiped out. One of the typical features is this yellowing in the uh, plants as they start to wilt. Uh, we found that the fusarium wilt in Australia probably occurs in all production areas, uh, in uh, cucumber production areas, in greenhouses. So there's a, a dominant strain that occurs. There are a few minor strains as well, but the key one is, is widespread right across Australia. Fusarium wilts generally are favoured by high ammonium nitrogen fertilisers. So again, not over fertilising your crop particularly with the ammonium form of nitrogen, can be very important in terms of minimising the risk of the disease really taking off. Uh, I've mentioned there that all commercial varieties are susceptible, but there may be some resistant varieties coming because uh, more than a decade ago, I looked at um, uh, a cucumber, which is not a commercial variety, and it was quite useful as a rootstock. And that's where we started to use it in uh, grafting. And uh, we've very, uh, been very successful in demonstrating that if you've got grafted cucumbers, they basically don't wilt and die uh, with uh, fusarium wilt because of the, these um, resistant rootstocks. Uh, one problem we did notice though, that if the transplants were planted too deep and roots, uh, adventitious roots grew from above the, uh, the um, graft union uh, down into the media, they could pick up the fungus and, and, the infect, and, and infect the plant above the graft union. And similarly, uh, sometimes if plants weren't trained early enough and the plant sort of grew across the surface of the medium and then up, uh, you had this contact between the stem tissue above the graft union and the root and the, and the surface of the substrate. So that also allowed the infection to occur. Uh, there's no chemicals registered for this disease. So again, uh, really having good farm and crop hygiene is extremely important. Uh, I know that um, in South Australia, where they uh, traditionally have grown in soil, they fumigate crops, but uh, the fungus is always able to find its way back in. And even where we've got um, people using new media bags in New South Wales, uh, quite often uh, on the farm itself, uh, dust and dirt uh, where the fungal spores will survive can blow back in or with handling and the like, you can move the fungus around. That image in the middle there can show, shows you, um, that's a massive spores, that big um, sort of orangey coloured thing. And there'd be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of those spores and there's these banana shaped spores you can see on the right uh, as well as two other types of spores uh, 
uh, one of which is actually something that um, can survive for long periods of time in the soil. So it's uh, um, a disease that um, I guess people live with. Hopefully in the future, more varieties will be um, available with resistance. I know that some of the telegraph cucumber varieties uh, have now incorporated this resistance into them, uh, but hopefully the ones, the, the be it alpha and the, and the Lebanese type that we grow in the Sydney Basin will soon be available as well. But at this stage, it's really a matter of um, how to manage the disease. As I said, chemical control is not really an option. And I'll finish it there. Thank you. I now invite Sylvia Jelinek to speak about um, the VegNet program. So thanks, Sylvia. Hi all, I'm the New South Wales VegNet Regional Development Officer. And this week it has been announced that the new $14 million VegNet 3 program is being delivered through Horton Innovation using vegetable industry levies and funds from the Australian government and led by Australia's peak vegetable industry body, Ausveg. So there's 10 growing regions across the country and New South Wales being one of those greatest new local land services is um, leading that one. And we're very lucky to be able to work outside of Greater Sydney and work with our colleagues um, in the regions as well. And we've identified four of our main priorities which we will be working with over the next five years so which is water management irrigation efficiency sustainable crop management so like your agronomy new varieties and soil health namely soil health and, and cover crops and your pest and disease management incorporating biosecurity and farm hygiene as well as advanced production systems so they're not set in stone priorities will move and, and change over the next five years and really looking forward to getting out and about on farm again and um, seeing all the, the growers and meeting some new fresh faces too. Thanks Maddie. Thanks Sylvia, that's fantastic news and really exciting that it's um, being continued so congratulations. Um, I'd like to launch one final poll for the um, attendees today to answer. Um, this is the last poll for the session and um, I guess I'd just like to make, it, um, make mention of some free diagnostics associated with um, this program. So you can send in um, samples for diagnosis for vegetable diseases or pest of concern um, to New South Wales DPI for diagnosis. Um, if you do need further information on that, please contact um, me at science at ausveg.com.au or you can contact Shannon Mulholland as well um, and we can get we can get some sample packages sent to you so that you can send in any samples that you need to to the group. So thank you all for attending today we really appreciate it. Um, please stay tuned for more events of this sort um, through the Perry Urban Biosecurity Pilot Program that will be running hopefully towards the end of this year if not early next year in the Sydney Basin region. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.